Welcome to Quality Improvement, Principles of Safety for HIT. This is Lecture A. The following unit is presented by Dr. Peter Pronovost, a practicing anesthesiologist and critical care physician, teacher, researcher, and international patient safety leader. Dr. Pronovost is a professor in the Johns Hopkins University and director of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality at Johns Hopkins. The Institute focuses on eliminating preventable harm for patients. The objectives for this session are to investigate the fallibility of people and systems, describe the ways that every system is designed to achieve the results it gets, apply the basic principles of safe design, explain the ways that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. The objectives of this session are for you to recognize that every system is designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. Second, to identify some basic principles of safe design that apply to both technical work and teamwork. And we'll spend a lot of time making sure you understand these principles that you can use today. And finally, to understand the evidence about how teams make wise decisions and how you can use that evidence in your daily work. I want to begin with a story. It's a story of a young surgeon in training who woke up one morning with slurred speech and tingling in her hand. She had a CAT scan that unfortunately showed a brain tumor. And then she went in to have what's called a functional MRI. It's a scan that measures brain blood flow. And she did it while she curled her fingers. And what the scan showed was that had the surgeons cut through where the, the part of the brain that they normally would, which is the shortest part, it would have resulted in the loss of the use of her hand and thus her career. So they cut through a larger, though much less active part of her brain, and she woke up with no deficits. This is one of the examples of truly the miracles performed by healthcare that we experience every day. On slide four, our same healthcare system still leaves sponges in patients. And we reflect on that and say, how could that possibly be? How could we have amongst the best healthcare in the world, state of the art, and the whole world looks to us for innovation, and yet we sometimes make mistakes like leaving sponges in? Now, this issue of mistakes and patient safety is an enormous, enormous problem. It also has a very personal uh, impact. Let's review of what we know. It, it shows that about 7% of patients suffer, hospitalized patients suffer a medication error. Somewhere between 44 to 98,000 people die needlessly from largely mistakes of what we'll call commission. That is, we do things we shouldn't do. Another 100,000 die from healthcare acquired infections. We'll hear much more about that later. Infections that for far too long we thought were inevitable. The evidence says that patients receive about half of the recommended therapies they should, somewhere between 50 to 100,000 people die from misdiagnosis a year. We don't really know how big it is because, quite frankly, we don't have great mechanisms to measure it yet. And all of these errors are enormously expensive, somewhere estimating about $50 billion in needless costs. So how could this happen? How could a healthcare system that is the best deliver care that so often falls short? The first reason why it is, is that we haven't really put science to the delivery of healthcare. Science is finding new genes. Science has been finding new drugs. But how we deliver care, how the information system flows, how the knowledge is shared, how we organize and finance care has largely been left up to the art of medicine. And as a result, patients suffer needlessly. So if we're going to try to improve that science or build upon it, we need to understand the foundation. And this section is going to give you that foundation. And there's five basic principles that we're going to walk through and make sure we understand. The first, and it's a hard pill for some to swallow, is to accept that we are fallible. 
You see, for too often in healthcare, we've operated under the assumption that doctors and nurses don't make mistakes, that we're perfect, that we expect perfection of ourselves. And when we fall short, which we will inevitably do, there's guilt, there's darkness, there's shame. And it's quite profound when we change our mindset and start assuming that things will go wrong rather than right. That as we approach our work thinking that we know we're human, we're fallible, and therefore we have to defend against mistakes. Some of you who have children may have done this when your toddler started walking and you went through your house removing breakables, putting gates up at the tops of the stairs so that you proactively identified hazards. We don't do that very often in healthcare and we need to. Second principle is understanding that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. That is, it's not workers who are to blame largely when mistakes happen. It's the system. Third is I want you to understand some basic principles of safe design. Now, we'll go into these principles in much more detail in future classes on human factors. But the three principles that I want you to take home are first, standardize care whenever you could, create checklists or independent checks for things that are important, and learn, don't just recover when things go wrong. Fourth principle is for you to understand that these ideas of safe design don't just apply to the technical work you do, they apply to teamwork. So how you communicate with your colleagues has to be standardized, you need checks, and you have to make sure you learn when things go wrong. And lastly, I want you to understand the overwhelming evidence that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. So that is make sure if you're on a team, you speak up and say what you are thinking. And if others are leading teams, that you listen to them because in the end, you'll make wiser decisions. Now, let's go through this idea of systems and see how every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. Well, there was a patient who was overdosed with morphine. Morphine is a narcotic pain medicine that if you give too much of it, it could stop your breathing. And when that happened, the typical response was, oh, that was the nurse's fault or that was the doctor's fault. And that was about it. But when we investigated it with this systems lens, we found something very, very different. We found that there was poor communication between the resident doctor and the nurse. The resident ordered something that the nurse suspected was not the right dose, but the nurse didn't speak up because the last time she questioned this doctor, she got barked at and didn't want to put herself in that risk again. We found that the doctor had inadequate training in physician order entry. We found out that there was no protocol for pain management in the physician order entry. We made the doctors guess what the right therapy was rather than supporting them. And there was inadequate decision support tools, that is, tools to catch this overdose, so to put ranges in to say, hey, this dose is out of what normally is prescribed, do you do it? So what superficially may seem like, oops, doctor made a mistake or nurse gave a medicine, in reality is much more complicated. And all these vulnerabilities could have prevented it. Now, this model that I'm showing you on slide nine, which is a model from Jim Reason, perhaps the world's greatest uh, internet investigator, is uh, called the Swiss cheese model. And the holes represent vulnerabilities or hazards in our work environment. And we all have them. And these hazards are dynamic. They change over time. They open and close. And when all the holes align, that is, there's inadequate communication, there's inadequate training, there's lack of protocols and management, errors could occur. But on the upside is closing any one of those holes could protect against the mistake actually reaching the patient. And that's what we're hoping you're going to do as you design and implement information technology systems. On slide 10, I put a taxonomy of different system factors. There's patient characteristics. There's things about the task, like entering an order. There's skills of the individual provider. There's team factors, the way the group works. There's environmental factors, whether it's noisy or dark all the way up to institutional factors. Now, the point isn't that you memorize this list. What the point is, is that you develop lenses to start to see 
these systems because most people in healthcare are system blind or at least system myopic. That is, they don't see these things. When things go wrong, they blame the patient or they blame themselves or their colleagues and they don't think about could lack of a protocol, could lack of training have contributed to the mistakes. And that's what we're going to be expecting you to do. Let me give you another example of this system factors. A patient in the intensive care unit went into a fast heartbeat rhythm. The doctor decided to treat it with a medicine called Esmolol, a short-acting beta blocker that slows the heart rate. A perfectly appropriate choice. He asked the nurse to get the medicine. The nurse got this vial, drew up the vial, and handed it to the resident. The resident assumed it was 10 milligrams a cc because we normally had pre-filled syringes of this medicine, but we had stopped making those pre-filled syringes to save some money. The resident gave two cc's what he thought was 20 milligrams, and the patient's heart stopped. We resuscitated the patient, and in debriefing it, I was standing there and said, you know, why do you think this happened? And the resident Again, not having lenses of systems said, I think the patient must have a bad heart. We better get an echocardiogram to look at it. To which I responded, I've never seen somebody's heart arrest like this to such a small dose of Esmolol. I think we gave an overdose. Could we simulate what we just did? And sure enough, we didn't dilute this medicine and we gave about a 250 times overdose. The case like this makes those who study this stuff, like myself, believe that the estimates of harm are the tips of the iceberg. Now here's some improvements in aviation safety over time. The improvements are really remarkable. What is generally known is that the early improvements in the mid-60s, late 60s, maybe early 70s, had to do with the jet engine. The jet engine fails much less often than a prop engine. But the improvements later on, at least in the mid-70s and early 80s, were really focused not on technology but on teamwork because the voice cockpit recorders of several air crashes sounded something very similar to the Air Florida crash that went into the icy Potomac River about 15 years ago now. It was December, cold, rainy day. The flight was behind schedule. And I'm going to paraphrase, not quote exactly from the record, but essentially the flight was behind, it was sleeting out, and the co-pilot was speaking to the pilot. The plane started rolling down the runway. He said, Captain, wings are boggy. Captain, we're slow on approach. Plane continues rolling. Captain, wings are boggy. Captain, slow on approach. Captain, slow on approach. Captain, not going to clear takeoff. Captain, not going to clear takeoff. Captain, we're going down. Seven admonitions from a scared co-pilot that apparently fell on deaf ears. Now, this wasn't the only case that the National Transportation Safety Board had in which it appeared that pilots just didn't hear words spoken by the co-pilot that were recorded on a voice cockpit recorder. So they brought pilots and co-pilots in to simulate. And what did they find? Well, they found that... Most often, what the co-pilot had to say was filtered. It was deemed not important, and therefore, the pilot didn't need to hear it. So they largely ignored it. Psychologically, they just dismissed it. And many, many crashes occurred because of that. Many errors in healthcare occur because of that, and we can't afford to have that anymore. Okay, so hopefully you have understanding now these lenses to see systems And importantly, you recognize that that teamwork lens is crucial, absolutely crucial. This concludes Lecture A of Principles of Safety for HIT. In summary, we've taken a look at some of the major considerations in developing a science of safety, including describing the ways that every system is designed to achieve the results it gets and applying basic principles of safe design.